Hey, it's Empire's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. For various reasons, <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about the father-daughter relationship dynamic, which is something that plays a big part in today's novel. The book is titled Malas, and it's about these two women in different time periods living in a fictional border town. And it poses these interesting questions about femininity and what it means to be a woman in a Mexican family. Author Marcela Fuentes talked to NPR's Isabella Gomez Sarmiento about the book, and she reflected on her own upbringing. See, she was the only daughter in the family, and she was definitely favored over her brothers by their father. But that also meant he was more honest with the boys than he was with Marcela. Find out more after the break. This message comes from NPR sponsor Disney, presenting Young Woman and the Sea. This incredible true story from producer Jerry Bruckheimer stars Daisy Ridley as Trudy Etterly, who risked everything when she decided to swim the English Channel. The movie is now playing in select theaters. Support for NPR and the following message come from Betterment, an automated investing and savings app. CEO Sarah Levy shares why accessibility is central to Betterment's mission. The real innovation for Betterment was taking a set of tools that were used by the ultra-wealthy and making them accessible to the average investor. And that includes tax strategies. That includes dollar cost averaging. These are all sort of tricks of the trade. Learn more about automated investing technology at Betterment.com. Investing involves risk. Performance is not guaranteed. This message comes from NPR sponsor ServiceNow, the AI platform for business transformation. AI is only as powerful as the platform it's built into. Enter ServiceNow. It puts AI to work for people across your business, providing intelligent tools to help remove frustration and supercharge productivity. And all of that is built into a single platform you can use right now. That's why the world works with ServiceNow. Learn more at servicenow.com slash AI for people. The teenage girl at the heart of the novel Malas has a lot of opinions about rock and conjunto music, about the boys she secretly plays in a band with, and most of all, about her dad. Mexican dads are stupid about picking names for their daughters. They're old-fashioned. They want something religious like Maria Guadalupe or super romantic like Isabella. Every other Mexican girl is named Maria Guadalupe and Isabella, but Mexican dads never stop to think about that. Why should they? They're Mexican dads. Whatever they say goes, period. But she's lucky because she's not a Maria Guadalupe or Isabella. She's a Lulu, short for Lucha, the fight. And she's in for a lot of those, especially when she crosses paths with Pilar, the mysterious older lady everyone in her Texas town has something against. Marcela Fuentes' novel Malas is an intergenerational story about two women, decades apart, coming to terms with their sense of self, their families, and their unspoken connection to each other. Marcela, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. So your book is titled Malas, which translates to like the bad ones, the bad girls. Can you define that a little bit more? Who are the malas? For me, malas really means misunderstood women or women who are doing things for themselves that maybe the community that they're living within does not agree with. And so I would define a mala as somebody who has decided that she just doesn't care what other people think and she's going to follow her heart. And that's that's where I'm coming from with that. Yeah, yeah. So this story takes place in a small border town uh, on the U.S.-Mexico border. Can you kind of set the tone of the place where it is? You know, what is this town like? How does it sort of change, you know, as as the novel evolves? Originally, I had looked at so many little border cities and decided that to respect and honor the histories of each one, particularly during the civil rights movement and how differently they all kind of interacted with that. I wanted to do a fictitious border town. And so this one is kind of an amalgamation of different little cities. My own hometown, Del Rio, Crystal City, Texas, Laredo, um, just to kind of give a sense of that history, but not tie it to one place and have to just work within those confines. And so Mm -hmm. it's a small community, but it isn't necessarily a sleepy community because the, the trappings of colonialism are still there over however many decades. And, and so we, we do see these kinds of lingering effects, but we also see the kind of beautiful uh, things that can crop out of these areas, uh, the music, the culture, 
and, and different really um, impactful things that have happened within these communities. And so I wanted to give a little bit of a, of a collage of that in this novel. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I want to talk about the malas in, in your book. <laughs> okay. You know, we jump in with uh, Pilar. It's the 1950s. Pilar has gone through these horrible back-to-back losses. Her marriage falls apart. She thinks that she, she truly believes that she has been cursed. How does she cope with that? You know, where do we sort of meet her in that early part of the novel? I think that the thing with Pilar is that when she first came to me, I felt her vulnerability. I felt her susceptibility. And part of it was that idea that she is like eight months pregnant when the novel opens. And there's a real sense of vulnerability with that moment uh, when, you know, a woman is maybe about to give birth and it hasn't happened yet. And she's like, oh, my God, I just want this to be over with. But also, you know, you are physically not as capable as you have always been. You're not really moving on your own anymore. You have somebody that you're literally carrying around with you all the time. And I think for her, there's a lot of insecurity about who she is as a woman. Like she doesn't know if her husband would be cheating on her. This is the time where she Mm -hmm. maybe doesn't feel beautiful. And this experience allows these terrors to kind of come in and inhabit her. Yeah. And then, you know, the book jumps forward to 1994. We're in the perspective of Lulu Lucha. She's very different from Pilar in a lot of ways. She's like this punky teenager who like loves Pantera and Selena and thinks that nobody understands her. Uh, But she's also very similar to Pilar in a lot of ways. What is their common ground? I think that the thing that they have in common is that each of them wants something and Maybe they are afraid to get it, but they decide that they're going to go get it. And they also have a similarity in the sense of dealing with grief. I think they both uh, have a lot of grief in their lives. And Lulu being younger and, and, you know, having a different relationship with the male in her life, in her case, it's her dad. I think she has a more, maybe a little bit, in some ways, a limited understanding of what that means because she's younger but also someone who is more accepting of these ideas and like maybe faith in herself because she is younger. And I think 14 is often an age when you think you're invincible. And Lulu certainly, uh, I believe she thinks she can handle anything, whether that's true or not is something else. But yeah, uh, there's that, that certain level of confidence that you have when you're 14 and you just don't actually know what's out there waiting for you. Something that I found really interesting about this novel is how much it really dives into the complexities of the father-daughter relationship. You know, you really get into the ways that Mexican fathers feel responsibility for their daughters, whether or not they take that as a good thing, and the ways which they exert control over them. Why was that a sort of like gender dynamic that you wanted to explore from these different generational perspectives throughout Malas? I think for me, it was definitely something that I thought about a lot um, as the only daughter in my father's household. Um, I have two younger (laughs) brothers. um, And it was definitely something that I will say, first of all, that I was a total daddy's girl. I love my father so much. (laughs) Um, And I was his consentida. I absolutely, my brothers will tell you, he was, he made no bones about who his favorite kid was. But he was, I think, more able to talk to them uh, on a, on a sort of, equal kind of conversation. There were things that he might talk to them about that he would certainly not talk to me about. And for me, I think it was this idea that he would maybe show me his best face, but not his real face. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, that kind of thing where, you know, he wants to be daddy. He wants to be just this great guy. And he was, don't get me wrong. He really was. But perhaps he would be uh, Roberto with his sons more than, more than just dad. Right. And I think that that is something that I certainly have seen in the community at large, uh, this kind of conflict between being very close with someone, but also there's that level of, but we can't really talk openly because you're a girl. But I think for Lulu, it's about the fact that, you know, he is the person whose approval that she wants so much, but he is so invested in his own kind of brokenness that it can be hard for him to see her Mm -hmm. so one of lulu's big beasts with her dad throughout this novel is that he really wants her to have 
a quinceañera. Lulu really doesn't want one, which I found so, so funny. Did you have a quinceañera? No, I did not. Um, but unlike Lulu, when I told my parents I didn't want one, they were like, oh, okay. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did not have one. I was really, I think, just not into my feminine side yet. And I found the idea of dressing up in this like frilly, like wedding cake size dress, just, I found it really awful and I did not want to do it. Yeah. It's a really like touch point coming of age moment for so many girls, so many young women in the Latino community. So it was really fascinating that it's like, you have this protagonist who is so annoyed that her dad really wants her to have one because she's resisting femininity so much throughout this. Uh, novel. And that seems to really be the the pinpoint of how she expresses that. Yes, that's definitely uh, something she's doing, which interestingly for me, um, when I was writing it, I realized that Pilar was super feminine. And she was just like, mm-hmm. I envision her as a Maria Felix, like somebody who's like, I just need to be on point all the time. And that Pilar would love this. She would love it and be great at it. Um, And for Lulu, it's like, well, okay, that's useful for me, but I'm not into it. Obviously, Pilar and Lulu are the protagonists of this novel, but there are a lot of really nuanced, complicated characters. The through line is that it seems like every single person in this book has some kind of secret, maybe multiple secrets that they're trying to cover up. And everybody seems to constantly be lying. Um, What does Mala sort of say about morality and forgiveness because it's like everyone is so obsessed with being a good person but everyone's sort of like lying to try to come off as a good person you know how does the book sort of grapple with that contradiction i think the idea is that if you do tell the truth that you might be a mala you know that if you do actually tell the truth and live your truth more than telling it living your truth that you might be a mala because Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's very difficult to to live your truth and be accepted as, you know, a good person. Uh, and I'm not even saying that all these characters are good people. I will not tell you that they are all good people, but I think <laughs> that I think that um at least in these communities um and, you know, every community probably has that issue. Uh, but certainly for for Pilat yeah. especially and, and and for Lulu, like living your truth and having your everybody's good opinion not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, especially when, you know, everybody's up in everybody's business all the time. That's like a given. It's a small town. So, yes, they always are. <laughs> That's Marcela Fuentes. Her new novel, Malas, is out now. Marcela, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. A former president found guilty while running for re-election. For a story this big, one podcast is not enough. Here at NPR, we've got you covered from every angle. You can get the news as it happens and legal analysis on the podcast Trump's Trials. And for all the latest on what it means for the 2024 election, head on over to the NPR Politics Podcast. Find Trump's Trials and the NPR Politics Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Homes.com. Homes.com knows having the right agent can make or break your home search. That's why they provide home shoppers with an agent directory that gives you a detailed look at each agent's experience, like the number of closed sales in a specific neighborhood, average price range, and more. It lets you easily connect with all the agents in the area you're searching, so you can find the right agent with the right experience and ultimately the right home for you. Homes.com. We've done your homework. This message is brought to you by NPR sponsor, Lisa, in collaboration with West Elm. Discover the new natural hybrid mattress, expertly crafted from natural latex and certified safe foams, designed with your health and the planet in mind. Visit leesa.com to learn more. 